Let's kick things off by open sourcing our repo. Um, let me actually paste some links in the chat that can navigate easily. Okay, looks like everything is running. Oops, ah, should be all right. Okay, so this is the repo that I have been working on for the past three, four weeks, give or take. And it's entirely built in Elixir with a little bit of TypeScript sprinkled in here and there. And let's go ahead and open source it. So let's go to settings, change visibility, and change to public. Okay, I'm just gonna use my password. And there we go. Like we are open source, let me confirm. Yep, it looks good. Now this is your chance to become the stargazer number one. So if you like, go ahead and smash that star button. <laughs> and in the meantime, I would like to look at how we have architected the app. So the bird's eye view, this is, oh, it looks like Gerge got the first stargazer, number one. There we go. <laughs> Sweet. So the app looks looks like this. Let me refresh the screen. I don't have a second screen, by the way, so I'm trying to monitor using my little laptop, which is kind of old. Looks like everything is good. All right. So the app architecture kind of looks like this where we have a central Elixir server in each region. We'll get to that in a little bit. And this Elixir node runs a bunch of uh, processes like an RTMP server and a web server, and it has connection to a Postgres database as well. And on the other side of things, um, we have, um, we're using a Tigris service which is this new startup that is an open source, uh, not an open source, uh, that's an S3 compatible object storage. So both our app as well as the Tigris app is running on the fly infrastructure. And we're sending over the streams to Tigris with an API call and the viewers pull the streams from there as a last mile delivery. And if you notice, there is no third-party streaming service or no CDN in the picture. That's because Tigris is taking care of all of those things for us, like the caching and replication and so on. We'll get to that in a little bit in more detail. But for now, I'd like to pull up my VS Code and take a look at the code a little. Pull this to the left, the right hand side, we can show this field graph. So you can think of our Elixir node as a supervisor, and whenever we start it, it is spawning multiple processes. Um, and one of these processes are RTMP server, and the one is web server, and then we have a repository that is responsible for connecting to the Postgres database and managing a connection pool. And then we have a telemetry process, we have a pop-up system, we have presence, we have a DNS cluster, we have Fly RPC. 
These are all running under the same machine. And on the left hand side, you can see all of these processes as um, children of our application. And if you're unfamiliar with how processes work in Elixir, they're basically um, very lightweight um, processes that are handled by and managed by the Beam, which is the Erlang virtual machine. Unlike the operating system level threads that some languages have, Elixir processes are super lightweight, so we can spawn a million of these like with ease. And another cool thing is that these processes are entirely isolated from each other. So when one of the process goes down, it doesn't affect any of the other ones because they share no underlying memory or data. And they communicate only by sending messages to one another. So as a result of this, um, Elixir is a super nice language to build concurrent and fault tolerant systems in. So if you look at the right hand side here, we have a main process running, which is the supervisor. And then that one spawns a bunch of other processes like the RTMP and so on, so on and so forth. And you can think that each of these processes, processes also spawn other, their own child processes. So this whole structure kind of looks like a tree. Um, this is also called supervision tree in Elixir circles. And each of these main um, processes are responsible for determining what happens if one of the child processes die. So as an example, if some request um, crashes, some request to our web server crashes, um, that is only handled by this supervisor here and it doesn't affect any of the other um, parents processes running. So that's pretty cool. And another cool thing about the Beam or the Erlang virtual machine is that it is super easy to cluster different nodes running. Let's say one node is running on Europe and the other one is running in US. Um, using the DNS clusters, um, we can easily connect these nodes together such that one process in one node can transparently send messages to the other one in the other node without even knowing that it's, it lives in a separate machine. So underneath this uh, Erlang virtual machine, it's as if every process lives underneath this like one internal network, so to speak. Um, yeah, so this is the application endpoint. And if we jump around a little more, so we have this Algora um, library, which is like the main business logic is in these files. Like we have a library, we have a module responsible for chat, for GitHub connection accounts. We have a mailer and we have a streaming pipeline, we have a storage and so on. And we have another parent module, which is only responsible for the web related things like channels, components, controllers, and live views and templates and so on. So that's kind of like the big picture of how everything is structured in the code base. And we also have a little bit of TypeScript as I mentioned, which lives in the assets directory here in the JS folder. And we have two files, app.ts and user socket. And these are pretty much only JavaScript that we're using. Let me take a sip of water. How's everyone doing today? Hey, McPizza. How's it going, man?
By the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions or comments anytime. Although I don't always see the chat in front of me, I try to look at it every now and then. Cool, so if we zoom back a little more and look at the other star of our system, in addition to Elixir, which is Tigris. So as I mentioned earlier, Tigris is this S3 compatible object storage. And what's really cool about it is that it automatically distributes your data close to your users. So let's say that I am streaming in Europe right now. We have a node running here. And a lot of people are watching me from Los Angeles. Because Tigris is deployed globally in multiple regions and they are able to track this usage by users in multiple regions, they can replicate the stream and cache the data in Los Angeles so that the users there get that video streams super quick and yeah, without anything that we do on our end. So so I think that's pretty cool that it kind of behaves like a CDN with no effort on our end. Actually, I want to show you the code real quick if, uh, if we look at our storage module. Um, <laughs> this is the entire code that I have written to upload files to Tigers and everything else like caching, replication, and so on are taken care of by Tigers. And I actually have their document documentation here. You can quickly look at. Um, in their overview section, they talk a little bit about their architecture. So let me zoom in a little bit. Full screen it. So this is their entire architecture. They're hosted on fly.io, much like we are. And at the very top of the funnel, they have an S3 compatible API. So much like you saw here, you just call the S3 SDK to send objects and also to receive objects from Tigris. And they store the metadata in these foundation DB clusters, which is Super cool. If you're un unfamiliar with Foundation DB, there are, I believe, an Apple project that got open sourced a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, um, so these Tigris workers basically um, communicate with these Foundation DB clusters. They cache your objects in these SSD caches that are deployed globally in these cache nodes in each of these regions. And they also send objects to a large object storage. Um, and if we scroll all the way down, yeah, there we go. So these compute workers basically send the metadata application stream to the foundation DB clusters, and then they cache the objects and then they distribute the objects to the block stores. So they take care of all of these things that you don't even need to think about. It's perfect. Let me put their homepage while I take another sip of water. That's awesome, Omar and Gergo. Let's go. All right, so where were we? Yeah, so we did talk about Tigris. We talked about our Elixir application a little bit. And now if we zoom in, zoom out even further, on the global scale, this is how everything looks like. So we have multiple fly regions that our app is deployed in. 
as well as the Tigris app being deployed in multiple regions. Actually, the Algor TV is only deployed in two regions right now, but I think Tigris is deployed in multi, uh, more than 20, if not even 30. I'm not sure. I think they mentioned that in their documentation. But yeah, so the as you can see, everything is globally distributed. Or in our case, it's not really global, but we'll get there eventually. Um, so we have, um, yeah, so we have distributed storage provided by Tigris. We have distributed compute provided by our Elixir nodes that are actually clustered together with each other. So like this node over here in the US East, let's actually make whatever, um, can send the messages to the process, to the node here, to the processes running in this node here and vice versa in the EU East. And we also have distributed data provided by our Postgres read replicas, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a little bit. <laughs> and on the network side, so if we imagine that there's a user here um, in the US region, and then another one here in the EU region. And they both, um, when they type tv.algor.io in the browser, um, this domain gets resolved to the same exact IP address. But this IP address, depending on where you are, um, routes you to the nearest fly region using the fly anycast DNS. So that's how we are able to um, distribute all of the traffic in the world. Oh, hey, Technologic. The Postgres DB in both regions, how are you handling showing chat messages between regions? So there are multiple parts involved here. If you are currently connected to the chat, um, your browser basically makes a WebSocket connection to the nearest node to you. So let's say you're in Europe, um, you make a WebSocket connection to the Algorithm TV here. And then whenever there's a um, chat message from someone else, without hitting the DB that um, gets broadcasted into your WebSocket directly. And if you're looking at the chat, not live, but in the future, let's say you open it up and see the old messages, um, that happens, like I said, using the read replicas here. We have a primary database in US West, let me name this, in the Los Angeles, region. I'm so bad at this. Yeah, so we have a primary database in the US West, and we have a read replica in EU East. So whenever someone sends a chat message, that basically gets inserted into the Postgres database here, and then that gets replicated to this read replica over here using the write ahead log and log sequence number tracking that um, fly RPC provides over here. I don't know if that answered your question, but It's okay, I, I don't mind interrupting the flow. I think it's more fun to do it interactive like this. Cool, is the stream running live for everyone? Let's see.
Okay, some speed coin. Take another sip of water. Cool. And next up, I would like to. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I would like to zoom back in to the ITMP server over here. And for that, I'm going to pull up my code again, our code again. And let's pull up the pipeline. Add some speed. Let's call this uh, audio. Video to give some visual separation here. Cool. So yeah, let's dive into how the streaming works. And it's basically this little pipeline that we have over here. I think it's the smallest pipeline that you could construct to make a stream available to to the world. Like it doesn't even have uh, adaptive bit stream, uh, bit rate streaming and all that. But it gets the job done for now. So the way it works is that your my encoder or whoever is streaming sends uh, their RTMP packages which in this case is my OBS running over here to our node running closer closest to you. And in there we have um, a demuxer that is splitting these packets into two different channels. Here we have the audio channel and here we have the video channel. And then those get parsed as H.264 and AAC. And after that, they get um, passed into the payloader, which basically turns these um, streams of video and audio into um, files of one second, segments of one second, so that we can mux these back into an MP4 which in this case is a fragmented MP4, and send it over to Tigris object storage um, as part of the HLS protocol. So in the code, we this, this whole thing over here in the upper, upper side corresponds to the source spin, which is this part here. Um, so this whole thing is the audio splitting up. And then we have a one second um, segmentation going on. And then that is passed into our sync, which is running this Algor storage module. And as you can see, this is super simple because membrane, this framework for multimedia processing in Elixir takes care of a lot of things for us. And similarly, we have the video channel um, which in this case, since we have already defined the source and the sync, it's just this basically. Sounds good, Omar. See you later. All right. So back in here. We have another question in the chat. What is the benefit of using Tigris here versus pushing the data to S3 itself and letting Cloudflow handle distribution of video to various locations around the world? To be honest with you, I've never used AWS S3 and Cloudfront. 
So I, I spelled targets and I saw that they handled pretty much everything without me doing anything on our end. And they would deploy to the same infra that we have deployed, the fly infra. And in my perspective, like the fewer parts there are running in the system, the better. So like instead of worrying about setting up S3 and then setting up another CDN CloudFront, and then I believe uh, the CloudFront only takes care of caching, right? Do they also do distribution? I'm not sure. But yeah, there, there are more things that, that could go wrong in that kind of a setup. Whereas with Tigris, it's literally two lines of code. And yeah, that that's a rational. Cool. Take another sip of water. And next up, I actually want to show how all of these different parts come together live using the browser dev tools. Let me pull that up in here and put the network tab on. So when we refresh the page, we're fetching a lot of images, but ignore those. Um, we are basically fetching this server-side rendered page, which I can show you here. Oh, entirely server-side rendered. And at the same time, where is this? Yeah, here we go. We are making a WebSocket connection to the server, which basically means that there's a process running in our server per user, per browser, even per session. So this WebSocket is responsible for um, listening to user actions on the page and then storing a state for that. And depending on these actions, pushing a div back to the user. So to give you an example, see the messages here. When I click the stream, After the WebSocket, I think I clicked the wrong one though. There we go, this one. Um, there were no other, there's like no page reload here, but the live navigation was handled by this WebSocket. Let me try to do this again. So filter for this. Yeah, the second one, if I click here, it's gonna send some messages to the server um, PHX leave, and then Phoenix join. And then it's gonna pass this string to the server that we go to this page. Um, this is kind of making me dizzy over here. So let me put another stream on. Yeah, so, and then the server sends back only the diff that needs to change on the page. So it's basically the video part that changes on the page. So even though like there is um, ping and bonging back and forth with the server, everything is super snappy because the packages are super lightweight that gets transferred around. Um, and on the video streaming side, um, as I mentioned earlier, when we load this page, we're going to be fetching a playlist um, from Tigris. And then this playlist basically describes, um, actually it describes two other playlists that we need to fetch, one for audio and one for video and these playlists give us all of the fragmented mp4s that are one second 
long each so that we can fetch each of these again from Tigris like this so these are one second segments and we refresh and click yeah our browser is basically gonna continually fetch these as we watch the video along and as I said there's no video streaming service or there's no CDN here, all streamed directly from Tigris. So yeah, that's how it looks like. Oh, and one more thing. Let me go back in here and then try to send a chat message. So like I said, if I send a message here, oh, I see, that's the other socket. This, so we have two different sockets, one responsible for page level changes and the other one for the chat specifically. And in this, as you can see, there's a new message that I've just sent in this room um, with the body high and then after that, the server is sent back, confirming that it was sent from me, and then it sent the body to render in the chat um, window here. So it's super efficient. It's only the div, and this is with minimal JavaScript, which is amazing. Close this and then zoom back out. All right, let me take another sip of water. And let me clean up some things here. Let's see how our repo is doing. Got some stars. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, in the last part of the stream, I would like to, I want to convince Theo that he should go back to Edge and Elixir. And to put my mouth where, to, <laughs> to put my money where, where my mouth is, I'm actually live streaming this right now on this very app that I'm going to be using to convince Theo. Here we go. We've been live streaming for the past, the past half an hour or so. And as the CTO of an early stage startup, as you can see, I have over engineered the shit out of this app, but <laughs> as a result, everything is globally distributed. So we have, um, distributed storage taken care of by Tigris. We have distributed data provided by our Postgres read replicas. And we also have distributed compute um, using these um, clustered Elixir nodes. And with that, Yeah, so Theo, like a couple months ago, he made this video called Why I Am Moving Off Edge. And there he was like explaining this reasoning where in setups where you have multiple read replicas, whenever a user makes a request to put some new data in the database, like all of that, let me actually draw some stuff here and give an example. So let's say I'm a user living here and 
our primary is in the US West in this Postgres instance. So if I want to make a change in this DB, I have to make a request, which is going to come to this Agora server. And from there, it's just going to go to this Postgres. And then it's going to come back to me like so. It's pretty simple. Since everything is so close to one another, even though even if there are multiple round trips going on, I'm not going to notice the latency really. But what's interesting is that if the user is all the way over here, 